If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We're in biblical, bibli, bibliotheca sacra, article by Douglas, Dr. Douglas Sweeney, professor of divinity at Beeson Divinity School entitled Jesus's Promise of the Spirit and the Teaching of the Faith from Kerygma to Catechism. John 14, 15 through 16, 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and will remind you of all that I have said to you. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, I need the phone. Okay. I will need it right back. Don't keep this on. There would be no history of doctrine if the Holy Spirit had not promised the Spirit to his disciples in the upper room in the crucifixion. The New Testament scholars disagree about whether Jesus and the apostles were where they were by John 16. At the end of John 14, Jesus says to the apostles, rise, let us be on our way not until 18 1 after jesus had spoken these things presumably the words that he had begun <clears throat> in the upper room did they go out and cross the kidron valley to the garden of gethsemane many think it likely that they stayed in the upper room throughout the whole upper room discourse john 13 through 17 or at least the history of doctrine would have proven far poorer. Still frightened and confused, the disciples needed help understanding and believing, let alone handle it, handing on what the master had been teaching. They lived with the rabbi for about three years. Still, they failed to comprehend much of what the Lord had said. They abandoned him. In fact, when the growing got tough, one sold him out to the member of the Jewish Sanhedrin who sought to have him killed. Even the boldest of the group named Rock by Jesus Petros in Greek, Matthew 16, 18, denied him three times. Jesus seems to have foreseen their bewilderment and their weakness. In keeping with an inner Trinitarian arrangement, he assured them that the Spirit would soon come alongside them, abide with them, speak to them, reignite their faithfulness, and help them sort things out. A lovely addition to our session on theological journals. We now turn to modern Reformation. We're in the May, June 22 edition, learning to read the scriptures with the church fathers. In other words, not reading the Bible alone, but with friends in church history. And he's making an argument for the divine intentionality of the Bible which the ancient fathers had, which has been flattened out in the modern period. Ironically, this is true even when we have no idea who the human author was or even what century he lived in. 
as is the case, for example, with many psalms. This is even the case when a text by an earlier human author has been edited or revised by a later author, which makes the whole idea of human authorial intent confusing. Which human author's intent is authoritative? A canonical text may well be the latest edition in a textual process that was influenced by several different authors, editors, communities over the centuries. But no matter, modern hermeneutics insists that the fundamental meaning of the text is what the human author or author's editors meant. Sometimes this ends up meaning what a generic human could have meant. This clearly excludes the divine authorial intent, even if that was not the theologian's motivation. Why is modern biblical interpretation so determined to avoid appealing to the intention of the divine author as seen in the canonical text? It seems that modern biblical interpreters shaped as graduate students in the modern university feel greater responsibility to the medical metaphysical convictions of the late modern secularizing culture than they do to the church's doctrine of inspiration. This tension is expressed in the fact that a typical biblical scholar has one foot in the modern university, which is under the sway of philosophic naturalism, and the other foot in the church which holds to the dogmas of the inspiration of scripture and the Two Testament canon. Ever since the so-called enlightenment, the academy has been trying to wrest or take the interpretation of scripture away from the church and claim that only the dogmatic neutral scholar can interpret it objectively and scientifically. But to be dogmatically neutral really means being a revisionist who de denies the metaphysics derived from the central Christian dogmas of creation, trinity, Christology, divine providence, and embraces the neo-pagan metaphysics of modernity. Modern metaphysical naturalism and traditional scholastic realism, realism cannot be reconciled or harmonized. They represent two distinct and opposing versions of reality, and one or the other must shape our hermeneutics. One reason why reading pre-modern commentators as pre-enlightenment is so helpful is that they do not share the metaphysical assumptions of late Western modernity. Some inadequate solutions. Since the heyday of historical criticism, which we will call decadent criticism, in the late 19th centuries, evangelicals have attempted to find better ways to read the Bible. Obviously, the denial of miracles, the atomization of the text, the loss of biblical message, and the weakening of biblical authority constituted practical problems for preachers. The gulf between the academy and the pulpit has steadily widened in the past 200 years. The quest for a better way to read scripture helps explain why dispensationalism spread so rapidly in the earliest, early 20th century. It offered a flawed but a comprehensive interpretation of the Bible as a unified whole and thus allowed preachers to treat the Bible as if all the various parts added up to one coherent, unified set of theological teachings. Dispensationalism fills the void once occupied by church dogma, what Athanasius called the scope 
of the Bible or what Irenaeus in the second century would have called the rule of faith. It was only natural for preachers convinced of biblical inspiration, but de deprived of the historic rule of faith as the hermeneutical key to interpretation that they found this view of interpreting scripture attractive. There was much wrong with dispensationalism, but what it got right was the conviction that the Bible interpreted rightly is supposed to make sense of the entire volume. We will pick up that marvelous article by Dr. Craig Carter next time. Now we're in modern reformation again, only it's the January, February 22 edition. I'm not sure. How, I believe we are near done here. We're getting into poetry. It's not. Uh, we'll turn to some book reviews. All thy lights combine figural reading in the Anglican tradition, edited by Ephraim Rodner. Recent years have seen a growing interest by Protestants in what has been variously called the theological or pre-critical reading of scripture that has centered around a theological retrieval of previous and neglected avenues of biblical interpretation. Often these works detail ways of reading the biblical texts that are not strictly literal but often involve figurative or even allegorical readings of the text. The present monograph is much needed and fills a lacuna. The current body of scholarship tends to draw deeply from either patristic sources or the magisterial reformers, notably Luther and Calvin and around a narrower range of topics such as Christology or covenant theology. This volume focuses on a specific tradition, the Church of England, over a broader chronology from William Tyndale to C.S. Lewis, and touches a range of topics from law to ecclesiology, and so promises to be a welcome addition to the current pre-critical hermeneutics scholarship. And then it's got, oh, also this is reviewing some other, the knowledge of God essays of God on God, Christ and church by Michael Allen. The fear of the Lord essays on theological method. Over the last decade, Allen has placed himself as one of the most interesting engaging Protestant dogmaticians writing today, as the essays in this collection will no doubt evidence. I've always appreciated his ability to deftly weave together multiple disciplines from theology to church history to exegesis in, into an informative, coherent project. In this respect, Allen reminds me of the late John Webster, about whom Allen has written in recent years. Anyone interested in the doctrine of God and theological method will want to pick up these volumes. Another book review, Cal Calvin's Ecclesiology, a study in the history of doctrine by Tadaraka Maru Ama by Erdman's. 500 pages. The topic of Calvin and ecclesiology has long interested scholars, though most of this work has tended to be done by social historians interested in the societal impact of Calvin's ecclesial reforms in Geneva, the work of Robert Kingdon or Scott Mantesh. Substantially less work has done on theological contour and development of Calvin's ecclesiological doctrines. With the vast body of literature on Calvin and widespread interest that he and ecclesiology have garnered over the years, 
I was amazed that no monograph had yet appeared that elucidates the theological shape of his ecclesiology, tracing its development over the various periods of his life. Taraka Maro Uama has filled this gap with this new book. Having written a similar meticulous study on the development of Bees' ecclesiology, Maru Yama suit, seems well suited to the scholar to produce this study. The work looks to be an excellent addition to the body of Calvin's scholarship and the Reformation views of the church. We love those book reviews. Now we turn to Calvin Journal for some more baffled gabbing in the Blabathon on Permaculture by Tony. He's, he's hooked up, talked about virtues, and now makes the massive leap over into farming and, and forests. The third epic is Fair Share which acknowledges the Earth's carrying capacity in just proportion for all. <clears throat> Bear with me on this. Olgram notes that a sense of abundance emerges when we experience the gifts of nature, God, in human endeavor. Simultaneously, a sense of limits come from a mature understanding of the way the world works that it does not produce limitless resources. The juxtaposition of abundance and limits encourages continuously reshaping our ethical response to life's opportunities and problems. Consideration of personal consumption often requires temperance. How much is enough for needs and wants? After all, when we accept our own mortality and limited power, personal limits again become a reasonable bargain with the world. The ecological footprint concept is one simple method to audit and reorganize our demand on natural resources. Redistributing surplus is about beyond sharing our immediate circle of power and responsibility. He's quoting from Holgram. This ideal is challenging because traditional institutions of church and state are losing their authority, while corporations and other powerful economic institutions have regained enormous power with little, if any, ethical constraint. Here's his thesis, restoring land, planting trees, conservation practices, and so on, are similar commitments to redistribute, atone for our collective sins, rather than changing our lifestyles for nature's benefit. Holgram's ethics summarize his moral impetus for the agency that he sees fulfilled through permaculture Namely, humans should acknowledge the earth as the source of our sustenance and care for it accordingly. That's a blabathon. And an evidence of neo Kuyperianism run amok. Turn now to the Westminster Magazine with the continuing reflection on the work by students of Dr. Richard Gaffin, and we pick up with Dr. Matson, who studied, or Dr. Sutanto, who's at the Reform Seminary in Washington. He studied with Dick Gaffin in the 2010s, and I must say I'm so pleased and delighted to see Reform Theological Seminary with a campus in Washington, D.C. Secondly, there's Dr. Matson on Gaffin. It was reflecting at first on my time together with Dr. Gaffin that a theme and perhaps a warning started to come to my mind. Drawing from the Star Wars saga, as an academic or churchman gets older, you can either end up as Jedi or Palpatine. 
A Jedi does not take him or herself too seriously, delights in the success of others, thinks of others before himself, and takes joy in mentoring of younger students and scholars along the way, still holding grudges over that one negative book review or social snub against him or her from earlier years using every young student as an opportunity to highlight their own work and feeling threatened by another's success. I felt no palpatine energy from Gaffin. As influential as he was, he never took himself too seriously. When he was discussing his conversation with N.T. Wright, instead of insisting on the many points he had said or would say, he admitted that he was not quick on his feet and that if I were ever put on a debate with Greg Bonson, he would surely circle, run circles around me. He listened attentively and encouraged our work. There was a jovial sense of lightness about Dr. Gaffin and despite all the controversies he had been through in his tenure at Westminster, he never battle weary spoke of his past interlocutors well, and always refused to draw party and tribal lines. Since then, I've known a good many Jedi figures, and Dr. Gaffin is always the first that comes to mind. Thirdly, Dr. Gaffin has always reminded me explicitly or implicitly that theology is for the church. It's easy to get drawn up into the passing fad, fads of the day or be enamored by the prestige and promise of academia. While it is important to engage widely, this is a reminder that I should focus on those interests that should be of benefit to the Catholic Church or Church Catholic. Writing and teaching should come out of the conviction and not out of curiosity and vain glory. Dr. Gaffin exemplified that well. Take the subject matter of theology itself seriously, not yourself. I continue to take these lessons to heart today to keep one grounded in reality, and Dr. Gaffin has led the way in modeling them. And now for reminiscence from David Chen, a missionary to China since 2005. When God called me into the ministry in China, he brought me to Westminster Theological Seminary for training and molding into the image of Christ. What attracted me to the and the legacy of noted servants such as Machen, Foss, and Van Til. In my fellowship with senior Chinese students on campus, I kept hearing the name Dr. Gaffin. And it was clear that not just his teachings, but his person was felt and leaving a deep impression on them. Dr. Such as using the term, I was Gaffinized. Little did I know that throughout my ministry of life, ministry life, I would be tremendously influenced, loved, and supported, and able to serve side by side with Dr. Gaffin in ministry to China. And yes, I'm honored to say that I've been Gaffinized. Anyone that learned under Dr. Gaffin will immediately be impressed by his in-depth exegetical style of teaching theology. I've likened listening to Dr. Gaffin's class to a solemn, joyful symphony of God's voice, as these are the words of our creator and sustainer. Through Dr. Gaffin's in-depth exegesis throughout each lecture, the listener would realize he was listening to his high king, declaring the glory and truth of the kingdom of heaven. 
However, one did not hear the word of God from Dr. Gaffin in despair, but rather the love, grace, and care of the gospel shine throughout it all. Dr. Gaffin made each and every word of God come alive and touch people's hearts in Christ-centered, gospel-driven way. His hit classes were like the great hymn, Hallelujah. It was so awesomely solemn, deeply joyful, and the more you listened to it, the more you wanted to sing along with the choir, to sing in joy and thanksgiving. Throughout my tutelage under Dr. Gaffin at Westminster, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that his family had ministered in China as a missionary family when he was a child, and that Dr. Gaffin was born and had his early childhood in China. Dr. Gaffin would share with me and his family's love for that land and her people. And even after communism took over China, his family would go to Taiwan, known as the Free China then, and continue to minister to the people there. With this sharing of the rich love of God for the Chinese people, God has brought us together to serve the Chinese church in amazing and powerful ways. We shift now to Anglican and Episcopal history and a book review entitled The Later Stuart Church, 1660 to 1714, an extremely troubled time in England and the Church of England. Here he points to three paramount themes that dominate the period because of their capacity to ignite contemporary discussion in light of past experience. These are the conflicting sources of authority for the church, number one. Two, the relationship between clergymen and laymen. Three, how successfully the church exercised its pastoral function. Tapsell points out that this period saw a broad tension between clerical interests and the superiority of lay gentlemen and lords, which came to the fore in a number of ways, not least the unreliable support the church received from successive monarchs and political leaders. He underscores the point that the church was not suddenly and completely restored in 1660, but that rebuilding the church was a slow process that took decades to complete. The remainder of the volume is divided into two, the remainder of the volume divided into two sections, each devoted to a theme. Rather surprisingly, the reader finds that the sections are not three themes that Tapsell identified, but rather there's four themes, complementary approaches related to ideas, people, places and rivals. Jacqueline Rose from the University of St. St. Andrews opens the section on ideas with her essay, By Law Established the Church of England and Royal Supremacy. Here she points out the paradoxes involved in the practical meaning of royal supremacy in a period when the church experienced wide swings of royal favor and disfavor while the church was torn by ecclesiological warfare. Nicholas Tayake, a competent scholar, well-known scholar, follows this section with a title in a chapter entitled From Latitude from Laudians to Latitudinarians a shifting balance of theological forces that shows the course of development that ended with Archbishop John Tillotson's doctrine of divine benevolence becoming the new center of gravity. The section on people contains two excellent essays, Grant Tapsell's own study on pastors, preachers, and politicians, the clergy of the latter, later Stuart Church, 
complemented by John Spurr's work on the lay Church of England. The latter is particularly interesting as representing a subject that is very much in its infancy using fragmentary evidence as Spur notes is often socially skewed. And we'll resume that in our next session as we turn to the closing and, con and conclusion by Matthew Payne on faculty psychology in William Perkins, the Elizabethan theologian, reformed conformist. For William Perkins, the doctrines of faith and assurance are a function of the regenerate desire wrought in the heart of, by the Holy Spirit. This desire gradually proceeds through the faculties, renewing them, producing faith in the mind, stirring the affections, and gradually enabling the will to hold firmly to Christ with the assurance of knowing one's own election. When faith grows to fullness, then faith becomes assurance. The mustard seed faith has become a tree. Such people have reached spiritual maturity, both knowing and feeling the certainty of their own election in Christ. This explanation of Perkins' doctrine has many advantages. We've seen that it simultaneously accounts for Perkins' insistence that faith is in the mind, That's, that a single grace cannot be shared with the, between the faculties, and that regenerate desire begins in the heart. No reason remains to conclude that Perkins was inconsistent on such a fundamental and often repeated pastoral theology. The explanation offered here rests upon the philosophical and psychological categories that were basic to Perkins' intellectual context and avoids the reductionism present in various other scholarly proposals. Perkins cannot legitimately be framed as a narrow-minded intellectualist, a legalistic voluntarist, or an experienced motivated pastor interested in rhetorical strategies rather than coherence. Very nice. His doctrine incorporated a balanced and structured use of the mind, will, and affections, while maintaining an intense concern with the cultivation of personal spiritual experience. Perkins' prominent use of the anthropological categories did not mean that his theology was man-centered. On the contrary, Perkins' doctrine focused on the progress of God's sovereign, gracious work of regeneration in human lives. He used faculty psychology of his day to frame the gradual progress of God's transforming grace, not to transform grace into a human work. This gave his doctrine an intensely practical thrust urging believers to seek growth through full assurance, through employing their renewed wills to seek Christ via the God-given means of grace. A more extensive study might consider how Perkins helped seekers to distinguish between mustard seed faith from temporary faith, and how Perkins, reputedly a rigid double predestinarian, responsibly engaged with all people as possible recipients of God's mercy. Perkins believed that his was a theology of grace, not of despair, though his work has often been read as causing despair. This article has contented itself with demonstrating that Perkins' doctrine of faith and assurance was coherent and compelling according to the axioms of his intellectual context, and that abstracting it from that context has resulted in substantial misunderstanding.
of his ideas. Very nice, Matthew. Very nice. We draw that article to a close. We pick up with Mid-American Journal of Theology as we read this effort to uh, present Karl Barth's complaints against the Pactum Salutis predestination, what he views as the historicizing of the Bible. Be glad to be done with his article too, since it deals with the psycho babble and the babble fest blabathon by Karl Barth. The Jura Christ is the Christ for all people. See, he doesn't like predestination. The invitation to life in him is open to all humans since everybody is elect in him, the elect one. That's Barth's view. We may not draw de facto conclusions about the final scope of God saving those actions in Jesus Christ from historical givens. That is, we may not, in the way of historicism, that's Bart's complaint, draw conclusions about heavenly reality. This is to engage in what Bart brands as historical metaphysics. In short, since the Bible storyline bears witness that some walk with God while others do not, some believe whereas others do not, and some are God's servants or children while others are enemies, it is easy, following out what is discernible from heaven, historical givens, to come to conclusions about heavenly realities. Namely, that God will not and cannot also bring these enemies into the blessings of Christ. He's giving a gentle critique of Bart there. <coughs> Theologians. He views scripture and the history of redemption contained in it as a witness to God's word, but not God's word, which occasions God's revelation revelatory act of the new sit around read the bible it's not the word of god but if you have a little revelatory moment that is the word of god your little experience seen in this way the history of salvation in the bible witnesses in a singular way to a singular message namely the gospel of christ the gospel however as revelation is god's own activity to save and sanctify Bart therefore chides and censures the federal theologians, not for their recognizing and unfolding of the covenant of grace in history, but for their viewing that history as sufficient in itself to capture the covenant relationship between God and humans with our ability to have God's revelation in hand to assess and measure its meanings and implications for Bart, the Christ-centered gospel message of the scripture is lost to a covenant history wherein we can be perceived from history defines the scope of God's grace and human response defines those who may be counted as God's covenant partners. See all the blabathon going on here. Bart also disapproves of the notion that the history of redemption is a strung out story that eventually arrives at Jesus Christ. Yeah, because he hates history. As if the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is solely a New Testament entity. You see his misunderstanding there. On the contrary, as Bart sees it, the Old Testament also bears witness to the singular good news of Jesus Christ and consequently... It must be recognized as the work and word of God at every moment of redemptive history, give with the right hand, take from the left. Since Bart conceives of the word of God as a divine activity, a salvific activity, and that since salvation is in Jesus Christ, God's effectual act to save human beings, the word of God for Bart is dynamic, and active because God's speaking is dynamic and active only on, only insofar as attested to and as such 
it happens. Rather, God's word accomplishes on our behalf, and more it is a word of God in commandeering its recipients, bringing them to faith, conquering their unbelief, and hitting the target of their hearts such that they believe. Word of God is, is not, then, a story of redemption, which we chop into stages or dispensations, and then eventually piece back together as culminating in the gospel of Jesus. No, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that story, the history of redemption, which is the gospel of the word made flesh. For Dr. Kabart's doctrine of revelation, see his dogmatics, one, one, secondary literature with several volumes given. How many more pages have we got of that blabathon? Quite a few more. And then we'll particle on effectual calling. We turn now to the churchman, that delightful Anglican journal. And it's a book review of God's traitors, terror in Elizabethan England. And what were the Roman Catholics to do with Elizabeth and the act of uniformity? One nobleman writes, suffer us not to be the only outcasts and refuse of the world. Let us not your Catholic native and obedient subjects stand in more peril for exercising their Catholic religion and that most secretly than do Catholic subjects to the Turk more publicly, and do the Protestants enjoin their public assemblies under diverse Catholic kings and princes quietly. The authorities with one eye on Rome and another on Catholic Spain in Elizabeth's time simply would not or could not listen to these recusants. Pressure increased, as did plots, and failed Spanish invasions only caused greater hardship for the Roman nonconformists. With the death of Elizabeth in 1603, it was hoped that toleration was close at hand, and indeed Rome banned any actions by Catholics which might push James I to continue the policies of the former queen. However, one group of Catholics whom today we would call terrorists simply would not listen. The gunpowder plot failed to, to the joy not only of Protestants, but also to the majority of loyal, recusant Roman Catholics in England. And in its aftermath, any thought of toleration was shelved in a brutal, if understandable, crackdown. As child's comment, comments, combats, and weapons may change, but in its ambition for mass destruction, the powder conspiracy was a precursor for the callous and calculated plots of the day. Child's book is first rate, both in research and in storytelling. God's traitors deserve to be read, not least by Protestant Christians, who may find to their surprise in the stories of the English Roman community much similarity to the stories recorded by Fox of their own Protestant martyrs. We have another book review here, Joel and Obadiah, Disaster and Deliverance, written by Ewan Riss Jones and reviewed by Ben Thompson. At just 128 pages, this new commentary is an easy read, and in the manner of the Focus series, gives a brief introduction to the background and message of each book before walking the reader through each section, section by section, with a few distinct questions at the end of each chapter. This section by section approach makes the book very readable but does mean that some verses get a very light touch. The background material is well judged and avoids speculation or overly involved theological debates. 
Jones identifies what he considers to be the key themes of each book. The Day of the Lord, the Spirit of God, the Justice of God, Obadiah, and provides a brief overview of each theme that enables the reader to grasp the contours of the message of each prophet, Joel and Obadiah. Good stuff from those global Anglicans. Or the global Anglicans again in a different journal. This one is spring of 2022 with this exquisite article on the Song of Solomon uh, by Emmanuel Mukha Shim Shimana. Luca Shimano on marriage, sex, and the marital life of conjugal bliss. It's a marvelous, marvelous article. Gives so much encouragement to see these young people doing this scholarly work. Hi, Mary. Good afternoon. It really is refreshing. The language of Song of Solomon 7, 1 to 9 connects the images with the physical beauty of the woman, the bride. He compares her belly to a heap of wheat, breasts to two fawns, twins of a gazelle, mouth to the best wine, and so on. Perhaps he is touching each part of the body as he's describing it leading up to his lovemaking. All these charming words and perhaps physical touch end up with her giving him her love in return. 7 verse 12. The young woman has a key figure in her life, her mother. 8 verse 8. Mothers play a big role in the upbringing of children, especially girls. The bride in the Song of Solomon emphasizes that she learned about marriage and its attendant joys from her mother the one who taught her about the marriage covenant. Even in marriage, arriving, arising from a courtship based around love and desire, parents have an important part to play, giving advice before and after the wedding. In this last chapter of the Song of Songs, the bride's brothers also have a role to play. They know that their sister must keep herself pure and that waiting for the right time will be rewarding. If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. She compares wall and door as metaf metaphors for virginity and pros promiscuity. A wall keeps men out, but a door allows them in. In this case, a young woman is able to allay the fears of her brothers by confirming her virginity. Chapter 8, verse 2. In Song of Solomon 8, 5, uniquely in the book, the reproductive results of sex are in view rather than somewhere else in a physical and emotional pleasure. People who are planning their married life together often have expectations which are too high. Are they expecting to have children or not to have children? Are they hoping to have a good home and a place they can afford or travel all over the world? Newlyweds decide on many things which the two will achieve if God grants them life. The decisions they make will shape not only their being but also the generations to come. And it is important that they have right priorities, especially relating to children. The desire for children is no longer seen as an inevitable part of marriage. When I told one couple in their mid-30s, who are very close to me, that I was praying for them to have a child, they said to me, Dear, do not waste your time. We've decided to not have children. We shall adopt in our fifties. But now we want to enjoy life. This attitude can be very difficult for the older generation to understand. When I visited a friend's house and a nurse mother in a nursing home, she told me, My son, 
we had three children. My late husband and I tried to raise them well, and we sacrificed everything. We even saved some money for the grandchildren, but none of my children have been willing to have a child. I am now dying but desperate because I know this is the end of my heritage. My forefathers will never be remembered again. Later, I asked her daughter what had happened. For me, I wanted to be a missionary, therefore no child. The other sister wanted to enjoy life. My brother was a lousy boy. Our parents did a lot in raising all of us, but none of us wanted to have a child. And we'll continue that in our next session. It's been an utterly outstanding piece of scholarly work written very accessibly without techno mumbo jumbo. Presbyterian journal, The Covenanters, it's in 1837. And we're interested in it, not just for theology, but also for some of the ways in which they view society in that day. So we pick up there. It's good to read these guys. What is the title and author of that book? This um, is an, the title is Introduction. Oh, the author of that book. Um, you may be referring back to um, the one in Global Anglican. The title of the book is Love and Sex. Applying the Song of Songs in a Contemporary Cultural Context. I'm not sure. It's not a book. It's an article. I'm sorry there, Mary. It's an article in the Global Anglican, the sp uh, Spring Edition 2022, written by, if I could say the name right, Emmanuel Mukashimana. Global Anglican Spring 2022. I think you can order individual. If you go to the website, you can, uh, rather than get the annual subscription, which we have here, you can order individual. It's Spring 2022. And then he is Emmanuel Mukashimana, is a lecturer at Uganda Christian University. And I think that article could, should be read in all churches for high schoolers, for collegians, and for parents and grandparents to read. It's been absolutely exquisite. Exquisite. It's one of the best I've read in a while. And this is it, Global Anglican, if you can see that. Just exquisite. And good to see Christians Good to see Africans, too, writing so beautifully about marriage um, and family life. I mean, I, I feel like with, uh, with Tertullian of the late second century, where he spoke about how Christians keep their wives, they don't trade their wives, they love their families, they love their kids, they don't do abortions, they have a godly family life, and he used that as part of the life witness of a husband and wife in a very pagan culture. And he says, that's how what we're like, not like you unconverted people. So anyways, we turn over now to Reform Presbyterian, the Covenanters. And well, let's see here. We'll pick up with that custom and frankness. Generally safe, always honorable, which the public has a right to expect. Demand from the editor a statement of the course he intends to pursue. Number one, this is the editor. That the editor will exercise exclusive control in relation to all matters to be inserted in the pages of the Reformed Presbyterian and its management generally. As the chief, sounds like a job description, as the chief responsibility rests with him, Justice requires that this be allowed without incur incurring the displeasure of anyone whose wishes may not in every respect be met. It will be his interest, desire, and aim to please as far as obligation to truth and duty will admit. Further, fear or favor shall not influence. 
At the same time, counsel and advice will still be thankfully received and all suitable suggestions attended to as far as practicable. Number two, no pains will be spared in endeavoring to render the work useful and interesting to all who may have a desire to to have their attention turned to the principles of eternal truth and righteousness presented in the Bible and happily embodied in the Westminster Confession of Faith, catechisms larger and shorter, and other subordinate ecclesiastical standards. Harmonizing with these in doctrine, worship, discipline, government, the corruptions that mar the church's beauty and interfere with the sanctification of her members. To seek for the old paths, the footsteps of the flock, that they may, like our fathers, walk therein and find rest for their souls. Number three. The claims of Messiah, the universal government, and the obligation of the divine law upon men of all ranks and upon all communities of men, associated nationally or otherwise, will be maintained under the conviction that Jesus Christ is made head over all things. That's very reform covenanting, and it's a warrantable message for our, our times Christ is still king of every single nation on this earth. And that the statutes of Jehovah are universally binding. Number four, and we thank the editor of 1837 for reminding us of this again. Number four, no access will be given to communications calculated to unsettle the landmarks above pointed out. But if any, at any time, misrepresentation of persons, doings, or things be unfortunately made, a correction of the mistake will be thankfully received and cheerfully inserted and acknowledged. Number five, it cannot be expected that matter appertaining strictly to each of the general heads mentioned in the prospectus shall be found in every number. The limits of the work preclude this. Number six, the editor depends upon his brethren who hold the pens of ready writers to contribute frequently to the pages of this work. The diversity of taste, capacity, and extent of intelligence will be found among its readers. Requires a diversity of style, method of illustration, which can be furnished only by a cooperation of different writers. We'll continue that next time, which we're, he's discussing. It's a book review of Gesenius's Hebrew lexicon. I pray that he'll bring this to an end. He's actually discussing less about the Hebrew lexicon and more about the German schools that are fighting with each other. Let's see if this changes. We've already given our reason for not entering into any examination of the work which Dr. R. has translated, Dr. Robinson of Andover Newton Seminary. There is, in fact, no other which can compete with it except that of Viner. Okay, go ahead, Mary. I'll take it when you get it. The grand difference between these lexicons lies in the etymological arrangement retained by Weiner and discarded by Gesenius. The question as to this point is a practical one and must be settled by experiment. Our own conviction is that the arrangement which is most philosophic in theory is also the most practically useful. I found the global UK member subscription. Yeah, they have subscriptions for US, U, U, uh, UK, also for Europe. There's three or four different types. I'm in America, US. I'm not sure where you're at, but there's a US subscription, as I recollect. I forget the price. It's in British pounds. Um, I just re-upped that. I forget the exact price, but they will mail you a hard copy. Well, if you're in Chicago, dig around for 
the there's a U.S. I'm, I, I don't have the screen up in front of me, but there's a U.S. Uh, non-UK, non-Europe subscription. So if um, I'll try to dig that up after this session. Um, so I don't want you to get the U.K. subscription. Uh, but the U.S. subscription. Anyways, back to this Hebrew lexicon. This is an 1837 Article 2, and the old Princetonians, even to this day, thankfully, continue to work in Hebrew and Aramaic every day in the Old Testament. We are conserving, thank God, that faith in the old canon. They don't have to do that in a lot of the modern decadent Presbyterian and Episcopal denominations. And thankfully, some of the Southern Baptists are holding on quite strong. The true test is the comparative utility of either method. We are willing to admit, in deference to such men as Paso and his critic in the quarterly, that in Greek, the arguments against the etymological arrangement may preponderate. We cannot assent to the propriety of reasoning from Greek to Hebrew, from a language admitting all varieties of radical form to one in which the roots may be distinguished by the number of their letters. I'm going to skip this here. This, um, apart from this question of arrangement in the lexicon, there's little ground of choice between these lexicons. The authors have reciprocally borrowed from each other so that the great body of the two books is essentially the same. Weiner's great merit as an original lexicographer is thought to lie in his account of prepositions. And prepositions is the hardest subject of every language, into, for, about, and the like. It's hard in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, and Aramaic. Most of his genuine improvements have been wrought in the Latin manual of Gesenius. Those who use both works will often have occasion to observe the superior ingenuity of Weiner, which comprehends the definitions of a word under a few categories. We'll pick up with that later. As we now turn to Protestant theological journal, I'm sorry, Princeton Theological of 2019. And hopefully this is, oh, good, we're done with that other baffle gabbing thing. Now for a book review. Again, Princeton Theological Journal of Modernity. Adrian Thatcher's Redeeming Gender, Oxford University Press, 2016. In Redeeming Gender, Adrian Thatcher considers the theological problems of androcentrism and patriarchy through the history of one sex and two sex theories. He relies on Thomas Lacour's hypothesis of making sex, body and gender from the Greeks to Freud. Until the 18th century, humans were considered to be one sex. Men were the default more perfect rendering of that sex while women were defective men. That is just not so. That is just not so. The two sex theory, which may claim either the inequality or equality of two essentially different sexes is an innovation of the modern period. In contrast, Thatcher seeks a Christological and Trinitarian view of gender that resists the gender binary accounts for human difference and is egalitarian. Thatcher first describes the workings of one sex theory and its relevance to early Christian thought. Troublesome New Testament writers such as Paul's Christological endorsement of the male-female hierarchy, 1 Corinthians 11.3, and his notion that women do not reflect the image of God in the same manner as men, 1 Corinthians 11.7, I've never heard that before, 
Assume the one sex theory with its continuum of perfection. Various biological narratives were crafted to support this. And Aristotle, 500 years before Paul, incorporated them into his own conception of maleness and femaleness as principles rather than sexes. Again, this is a modern Princeton Journal, Princeton Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey. Biology, specifically the purported male role in conception, correlated with the male's natural superiority and the female's natural inferiority. This is Aristotle. Such was Paul's intellectual milieu and Thatcher briskly illustrates the endurance of the one sex theory through Tertullian, Aquinas, Kant, and Hegel, noting that such endurance demonstrates the disruptive innovation of the post of the modern period's two sex theory. And that is really unfair to Tertullian and Aquinas. Thatcher notes that in the history of one and two sex theories, Christian churches have not aligned themselves with one another, instead appealing to both, both what he dubs the modern mix. The circumstance is problematic. To illustrate, Thatcher makes an example of Catholicism's male-only priesthood. The Vatican affirms, on the one hand, the Nicene and Chalcedonian definitions of Christ's manhood as referent to his humanity. Man in the creeds is inclusive. Neither the Greek nor the Latin mentions Christ's sex. Yet the inclusive conception of Christ's human nature is abandoned when it comes to the ordination of women. The Vatican asserts that women must be barred from the priesthood because Christ's incarnation took place according to the male sex. The weight given to Christ's sex in this instance is not permitted by creedal Christology, Thatcher claims. The move may be useful to the Orthodox Christian who seeks fresh and convincing theological ground for gender-exclusive priesthood. Beyond the modern mix, Thatcher notes the strengths and deficiencies of the one and two sex theories separately. The one sex theory has never existed without a scale of perfection, privileging men to go with it, but its value does lie in its ability to affirm a single human nature against separate male and female natures, the crux of Thatcher's own proposal. We'll bring that book who is learned to the confession. The book is by Scott McKnight. He was a Baptist and now he's turned to the Mer Anglican Church. Um, I believe that's right. It takes a, the title of the book, It Takes a Church to Baptize, What the Bible Says About Infant Baptism, 128 pages. Addressing the perennial, to, here's the book review, to perennial topic of infant baptism in the last decade or so, several books addressed to the subject. Scott McKnight, professor of New Testament at Northern Baptist Seminary in Lombard, Illinois, brings a unique perspective on the issue. Raised in the Anabaptist tradition or Baptist tradition, he converted to Anglicanism and was ordained as a priest in the Anglican Communion in 2014. He's a popular speaker, blogger, and writer employing a comfortable writing style on this important theological issue. Noting his own conversion, he, who a guy who'd been a former Pentecostal, fleeted right up to bishop in the Anglican church, you know, overnight, a Pentecostal Anglican. Bishop Todd D. Hunter's forward sets the tone for this short, very readable book. Hunter was also evangelically trained and questioned baptism as a regenerative 
baptized as a Methodist, rebaptized as the leader of the Vineyard Movement. His conclusion after studying the subject more carefully is that infant baptism is theologically, biblically, historically, and personally the most credible position a committed Christian can take. He the, endorses McKnight's book, which McKnight it, admits is designed for those who are considering infant baptism in the Anglican community. Giving a brief introductory preface, McKnight launches into his presentation with his chapter, Our Baptism, the first six words. The key words are family, Bible, gospel, conversion, debate, and heritage. Here, Lutheran readers will already pause since we would most likely look at Jesus' invitation, John 3 and Matthew 28, as well as his promises. Regarding family, he states infant baptism is the deepest, wisest, and most historic Christian way of forming our children into the faith. Admitting there is no text in the New Testament that explicitly reveals the practice of infant baptism in the apostolic church, he does affirm that implicitly a theology for infant baptism is to be found there, citing Acts 2.38, Galatians 3.27 and 1 Peter 3.21. Leaning heavily on these six words, McKnight delves into the Anglican context of baptism. Following the Anglican baptismal liturgy from the Book of Common Prayer, McKnight shows its biblical connections. He emphasizes the family context for baptism and its covenantal significance. Although this approach is not completely convincing, he does make some interesting points about our American individualism as well as a helpful analogy to citizenship. One citizenship was established at birth by an act of Congress. So we can do this in our next session. As we turn now to the Southwestern Theological Journal on the book of Hebrews, um, uh, one of the ways the author indicates that God's word is still speaking is with the introductory formulas that he uses, which always employ speaking verbs, especially the forms of the verb lego. This clearly contrasts with Paul's epistles, where scripture citations are usually introduced with writing verbs, especially the formulaic gegropti. Hebrews also contrasts with the Gospels, which often also use writing verbs to introduce scripture citations to confirm or explain the previously made point. Thus, in Hebrew, Scripture is presented as the very words of God spoken that continue to speak anew and afresh, not only in the times in which they were written, but also for the contemporary hearers and readers of Hebrews. There are also clear Christological implications that flow from the author's understanding of Scripture. Consider, for example, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, quote, At many times and in many ways in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. I'll just notice that Bishop Theophilus Herter loved quoting that verse repeatedly. The given in these verses is that God speaks contrast is between how he has spoken in the past and how he is speaking today. As I've written elsewhere, here is both comedy and discomedy. We'll continue that in our next session as we turn to the logical journal. We are, love this journal. We are so happy this is about, uh, this article is about to argue for male 
Court of Deacons, and he's going to take a little reconnaissance tour on the DEC on Word Group, which is used in many verses that connect leadership to service. These two are heartwarmingly intertwined. The pertinent statement concerns our Lord. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ said to the twelve, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Paul often referred to his apostolic calling as diakonia, usually translated as ministry. In addition to the connection between leadership and service, all Christians are concert, encouraged to consider their lives as a life of service to Christ and to others. Christ said, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant, Di Diakonos. But also, Peter remarks, as each has received a gift, use it to serve Diakoneo, one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace. God commends the church at Thyatira. I know your works, your love and service service and patient obedience. The above shows the wonderful general use of the diacon word group that highlights service in all Christian endeavors. In addition to this general use, there's a more specific use connected with serving meals and financially helping others. In the gospel, especially the diacon word group is used for serving meals. To give one example, they gave a dinner for him. There Martha served diaconeo, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him, John 12, 2. Several times the diacon word group refers to aiding physical needs and providing food. Here the English translations are appropriately creative. For example, so that it Disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief, diakonia, to the brothers of Judea, Acts eleven twenty nine. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided diakonia for them out of their means. We'll continue the reconnaissance tour next time. And now we continue with Protestant Reformed Theological Journal on neo kyperian Theology of Glory and Reformed Higher Education. Also common among those within the neo kyperian movement is the use of triumphalist, an aspirational language which flows from a view that the kingdom of God is something to be obtained and built on this earth. One only has to look at the recruiting and marketing lecture, li literature of most reformed institutions of higher learning to find the vocabulary of neo kyperianism At such place, Christian is an agent of renewal or a co-worker with Christ in redeeming culture. Students at such institutions can expect both themselves and the broader world to flourish as they learn how to focus their skills and abilities on the kingdom of Christ. Texts such as 2 Corinthians 10, 5 are invoked in this great enterprise. For who would not want to bring every thought into captivity or every thought into obedience to Christ? Again, the concept of Christ's lordship over creation is not just indicative of his power, but also an imperative for all believers to act upon. Perhaps the most important thing that separates neo kyperianism from Kuiper himself, however, is the theological drift that is required to maintain such triumphalist aspirations of a, of a utopian movement set on winning the culture for Christ. Recall that Kuiper himself was care, 
careful to hang on to the doctrine of the antithesis, a principle of spiritual separation between the church and the world as outlined in the Belgic Confession. At the same time, he developed his doctrine of common grace. The tenuous balance he thought would be able to curb the potentially dangerous excesses of common grace. That these dangers were evident from the very inception of the development of the doctrine are clear from the words of the synod that had adopted this on behalf of the Christian Reformed Church in 1924. We quote, there is a danger here which ought not to be ignored. When Dr. Kuiper wrote about this in his monumental work dealing with the subject of common grace, he indicated he was aware of this danger that some might be misled and might lose their way in this world. Think of Tony Bierma's little article in Cal's journal. And history has already proven that this danger is re more real than prophetic. And now for Thamelios, and we're doing an article here, I believe, if it will repopulate appropriately. Um, where are we? You give me a second. I have to come back and find that. We've sort of the Journal of Theological Studies, 1908. There are many of us who are conscious that the ex works which were written in defense of the others do not really appeal to the minds of men in the present day. That much of the traditional apologetic is not relevant to the questions that are being forced on our attention. This paper attempts to show how it has come about. Perhaps it may seem paradoxical, but I am inclined to think that the defenders of the faith have laid too much stress on the resemblances between science and religion, and that in facing their real differences, that the best hope of an ultimate reconciliation lies. That is, at all, all events, the principle which underlies this principle, this present paper. The first great difference is this, that science starts from the particular and religion from the universal. They begin at opposite ends. In the face of this difference, it is idle to assert that there is no conflict between science and religion, that since truth is one, truth and science and true religion cannot conflict. This maxim gives no help to those who are anxiously asking the question, what is truth, and fail to find a completely convincing answer. To the man of deep spiritual conviction is the truth, while, script, while science seems to be a mass of changing opinion. We'll talk about that in our next uh, session. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.